A Pipe of Mystery by G. A. Henty. A jovial party were gathered round a blazing fire in an old grange near Warwick. The hour was getting late. The very little ones had, after dancing round the Christmas tree, enjoyed the snapdragon and playing a variety of games, gone off to bed. And the elder boys and girls now gathered round their uncle, Colonel Harley, and asked him for a story, above all, a ghost story. "'But I have never seen any ghosts,' the colonel said, laughing, "'and, moreover, I don't believe in them one bit. I've travelled pretty well all over the world. I've slept in houses said to be haunted, but nothing have I seen, no noises that could not be accounted for by rats or the wind have I ever heard. I have never—' And here he paused. Never but once met with any circumstances or occurrence that could not be accounted for by the light of reason, and I know you prefer hearing stories of my own adventures to mere invention. Yes, uncle, but what was the once when circumstances happened that you could not explain? Well, it's rather a long story, the colonel said, and it's getting late. Oh, no, no, uncle, it does not matter a bit how late we sit up on Christmas Eve, and the longer the story is, the better. And if you don't believe in ghosts, how can it be a story of something you could not account for by the light of nature? Well, you will see when I have done, the colonel said. It's rather a story of what the Scotch call second sight than one of ghosts. As to accounting for it, you shall form your own opinion when you have heard me to the end. I landed in India in fifty, after going through the regular drill work, marked with a detachment up country to join my regiment which was stationed at Jubalpur in the very heart of India. It's become an important place since. The railroad across India passes through it, and no end of changes have taken place, but at that time it was one of the most out-of-the-way stations in India, and, I may say, one of the most pleasant. It lay high, there was capital boating on the Nabrada, and, above all, it was a grand place for sport, for it lay at the foot of the hill country, an immense district, then but little known, covered with forests and jungle, and abounding with big game of all kinds. My great friend there was a man named Simmons. He was just of my own standing. We'd come out in the same ship, had marched up the country together, and were almost like brothers. He was an old Etonian, I am an old Westminster, and we were both fond of boating, and indeed of sports of all kinds. But I'm not going to tell you of that now. The people in these hills are called Gons, a true hill tribe, that is to say, aborigines, somewhat of the negro type. The chiefs are of mixed blood, but the people are almost black. They are supposed to accept the religion of the Hindus, but are in reality deplorably ignorant and superstitious. Their priests are a sort of compound of a Brahmin priest and a negro fetish man, and among their principal duties is that of charming away tigers from the villages by means of incantations. There, as in other parts of India, were a few wandering fakirs who enjoyed an immense reputation for holiness and wisdom. The people would go to them from great distances for charms or predictions, and believed in their power with implicit faith. At the time when we were in Jubalpur, there was one of these fellows whose reputation altogether eclipsed that of his rivals, and nothing could be done until his permission had been asked and his blessing obtained. All sorts of marvellous stories were constantly coming to our ears of the unerring foresight with which he predicted the termination of diseases, both in men and animals, and so generally was he believed in that the colonel ordered that no one connected with the regiment should consult him, for these predictions very frequently brought about their own fulfilment. For those who were told that an illness would terminate fatally, lost all hope, and literally lay down to die. However, many of the stories that we heard could not be explained on these grounds, and the fakir and his doings were often talked over at mess, some of the officers scoffing at the whole business, others maintaining that some of these fakirs had, in some way or another, the power of foretelling the future, citing many well-authenticated anecdotes upon the subject. The older officers were the believers, we young fellows were the scoffers but for the well-known fact that it's very seldom indeed that these fakers will utter any of their predictions to Europeans, some of us would have gone to him to test his powers. As it was, none of us had ever seen him. He lived in an old ruined temple in the middle of a large patch of jungle at the foot of the hills, some ten or twelve miles away. I'd been at Jubalpur about a year when I was woke up one night by a native 
who came in to say that at about eight o'clock a tiger had killed a man in his village and had dragged off the body. Simmons and I were constantly out after tigers, and the people in all the villages within twenty miles knew that we were always ready to pay for early information. This tiger had been doing great damage, and had carried off about thirty men, women, and children. So great was the fear of him, indeed, that the people in the neighborhood he frequented scarcely dared stir out of doors, except in parties of five or six. We had had several hunts after him, but like all man-eaters he was old and awfully crafty, and although we got several snap-shots at him, he had always managed to save his skin. In a quarter of an hour after the receipt of the message, Charlie Simmons and I were on the back of an elephant, which was our joint property. A shikari, a capital fellow, was on foot beside us, and with the native trotting on ahead as guide, we went off at the best pace of old Begum, for that was the elephant's name. The village was fifteen miles away, but we got there soon after daybreak, and were received with delight by the population. In half an hour the hunt was organized, all male population turned out as beaters, with sticks, guns, tom-toms, and other instruments for making a noise. The trail was not difficult to find, a broad path with occasional smears of blood, showed where the tiger had dragged his victim through the long grass to a cluster of trees a couple of hundred yards from the village. We scarcely expected to find him there, but the villagers held back while we went forward with cocked rifles. We found, however, nothing but a few bones and a quantity of blood. The tiger had made off at the approach of daylight into the jungle, which was about two miles distant. We traced him easily enough and found that he had entered a large ravine, from which several smaller ones branched off. It was an awkward place, as it was next to impossible to surround it with the number of people at our command. We posted them at last all along the upper ground, and told them to make up in noise what they wanted in numbers. At last all was ready, and we gave the signal. However, I am not telling you a hunting story, and need only say that we could neither find nor disturb him. In vain we pushed Begum through the thickest of the jungle which clothed the sides and bottom of the ravine, while the men shouted, beat their tom-toms, and showered imprecations against the tiger himself and his ancestors up to the remotest generations. The day was tremendously hot, and after three hours' march we gave it up for a time and lay down in the shade, while the shikaris made a long examination of the ground all round the hillside to be sure that the tiger had not left the ravine. They came back with the news that no traces could be discovered, and that, beyond a doubt, he was still there. A tiger will crouch up in an exceedingly small clump of grass or bush, and will sometimes almost allow himself to be trodden on before moving. However, we determined to have one more search, and if that should prove unsuccessful, to send off to Jubalpur for some more of the men to come out with elephants, while we kept up a circle of fires and of noises of all descriptions so as to keep him a prisoner until the arrival of the reinforcements. Our next search was no more successful than our first had been, and having, as we imagined, examined every clump and crevice in which he could have been concealed, we had just reached the upper end of the ravine when we heard a tremendous roar, followed by a perfect babel of yells and screams from the natives. The outburst came from the mouth of the ravine, and we felt at once that he had escaped. We hurried back to find, as we had expected, that the tiger was gone. He had burst out suddenly from his hiding-place, had seized a native, torn him horribly, and had made across the open plain. Now this was terribly provoking, but we had nothing to do but follow him. This was easy enough, and we traced him to a detached patch of wood and jungle two miles distant. This wood was four or five hundred yards across, and the exclamations of the people at once told us that it was the one in which stood the ruined temple of the fakir of whom I had been telling him. Oh, I forgot to say that as the tiger broke out, one of the village shikaris had fired, and, he declared, wounded the tiger. It was already getting late in the afternoon, and it was hopeless to attempt to beat the jungle that night. We therefore sent off a runner with a note to the colonel, asking him to send the work elephants, and to allow a party of volunteers to march over at night to help surround the jungle when we commenced beating it in the morning. We based our request upon the fact that the tiger was a notorious man-eater, and had been doing immense damage. We then had a talk with our shikari, sent a man off to bring provisions for the people out with us, and then sent them to work setting dry sticks and grass to make a circle of fires. 
we both felt much uneasiness respecting the fakir, who might be seized at any moment by the enraged tiger. The natives would not allow that there was any cause for fear, as the tiger would not dare to touch so holy a man. Our belief in the respect of the tiger for the sanctity was by no means strong, and we determined to go in and warn him of the presence of the brute in the wood. It was a mission which we could not entrust to anyone else, for no native would have entered the jungle for untold gold. So we mounted the begum again and started. The path leading towards the temple was pretty wide, and as we went along almost noiselessly, for the elephant was too well trained to tread upon fallen sticks, it was just possible we might come upon the tiger suddenly. So we kept our rifles in readiness in our hands. Presently we came in sight of the ruins. No one was at first visible, but at that very moment the fakir came out from the temple. He could not see or hear us, for we were rather behind him and still among the trees, but at once proceeded in a high voice to break into a sing-song prayer. He had not said two words before his voice was drowned in a terrific roar, and in an instant the tiger had sprung upon him, struck him to the ground, seized him as a cat would a mouse, and started off with him at a trot. The brute evidently had not detected our presence, for he came right toward us. We halted the begum, and, with our fingers on the triggers, awaited a favorable moment. He was a hundred yards from us when he struck down his victim. He was not more than fifty when he caught sight of us. He stopped for an instant in surprise. Charlie muttered, Both barrels, Harley, and as the beast turned to plunge into the jungle, and so showed us his side, we sent four bullets crashing into him, and he rolled over lifeless. We went up to the spot, made the begum give him a kick, to be sure that he was dead, and then got down to examine the unfortunate fakir. The tiger had seized him by the shoulder, which was terribly torn, and the bone broken. He was still perfectly conscious. We had once fired three shots, our usual signal that the tiger was dead, and in a few minutes were surrounded by the villagers, who hardly knew whether to be delighted at the death of their enemy, or to grieve over the injury to the fakir. We proposed taking the latter to our hospital at Jubalpur, but this he positively refused to listen to. However, we finally persuaded him to allow his arm to be set and the wounds dressed in the first place by our regimental surgeon, after which he could go to one of the native villages and have his arm dressed in accordance with his own notions. A litter was soon improvised, and away we went to Jubalpur, which we reached about eight in the evening. The fakir refused to enter the hospital, so we brought out a couple of trestles, laid the litter upon them, and the surgeon set his arm and dressed his wounds by torchlight, when he was lifted into a dolly, and his bearers again prepared to start for the village. Hitherto he had only spoken a few words, but he now briefly expressed his deep gratitude to Simmons and myself. We told him that we would ride over to see him shortly, and hoped to find him getting on rapidly. Another minute, and he was gone. It happened that we had three or four fellows away on leave or on staff duty, and several others laid up with fever just about this time, so that the duty fell very heavily upon the rest of us, and it was over a month before we had time to ride over to see the fakir. We had heard he was going on well, but we were surprised on reaching the village to find that he had already returned to his old abode in the jungle. However, we had made up our minds to see him, especially as we had agreed that we would endeavor to persuade him to do a prediction for us so we turned our horses' heads toward the jungle. We found the fakir sitting on a rock in front of the temple, just where he had been seized by the tiger. He rose as we rode up. I knew that you would come to-day, sahibs, and was joyful in the thought of seeing those who had preserved my life. We're glad to see you, looking pretty strong again, though your arm is still in a sling, I said, for Simmons was not strong in Hindustani. "'How did you know that we were coming?' I asked, when we had tied up our horses. "'Siva has given to his servant to know many things,' the fakir said quietly. "'Did you know beforehand that the tiger was going to seize you?' I asked. "'I knew that a great danger threatened, and that Siva would not let me die before my time had come. "'Could you see into our future?' I asked. The fakir hesitated looked at me for a moment earnestly to see if I was speaking in mockery, and then said, "'The sahibs do not believe in the power of Siva or of his servants. They call his messengers impostors, and scoff at them when they speak of the events of the future.' 
"'No, indeed,' I said. "'My friend and I have no idea of scoffing. "'We had heard so many of your predictions come true, "'and that we are really anxious that you should tell us something of the future.' The fakir nodded his head, went into the temple, and returned in a minute or two with two small pipes, used by the natives, for opium, and a brazier of burning charcoal. The pipes were already charged. He made signs to us to sit down, and took his place in front of us. Then he began singing in a low voice, rocking himself to and fro, and waving a staff which he held in his hand. Gradually his voice rose and his gesticulations and actions became more violent. So far as I could make out, it was a prayer to Siva that he would give some glimpse of the future which might benefit the sahibs who had saved the life of the servant. Presently he darted forward, gave us each a pipe, took two pieces of red-hot charcoal from the brazier in his fingers, without seeming to know that they were warm, and placed them in the pipes. Then he recommenced his singing and gesticulations. A glance at Charlie to see if, like myself, he was ready to carry the thing through, and then I put the pipe to my lips. I felt at once that it was opium, of which I had before made experiment, but mixed with some other substance, which was, I imagine, hashish, a preparation of hemp. A few puffs, and I felt a drowsiness creeping over me. I saw, as through a mist, the fakir swaying himself backwards and forwards, his arms waving and his face distorted. Another minute, and the pipe slipped from my fingers, and I fell back insensible. How long I lay there I do not know. I woke with a strange and not unpleasant sensation, and presently became conscious that the fakir was gently pressing with a sort of shampooing action, my temples and head. When he saw that I opened my eyes, he left me and performed the same process upon Charlie. In a few minutes he rose from his stooping position waved his hand in token of adieu, and walked slowly back into the temple. As he disappeared, I sat up. Charlie did the same. We stared at each other for a minute without speaking, and then Charlie said, oh, This is a rum go, and no mistake, old man. You're right, Charlie. My opinion is we've made fools of ourselves. Let's be off out of this. We staggered to our feet, for we both felt like drunken men, made our way to our horses, poured a mossack of water over our heads, took a drink of brandy from our flasks, and then, feeling more like ourselves, mounted and rode out of the jungle. Well, Harley, if the glimpse of futurity which I had is true, all I can say is that it was extremely unpleasant. Yes, that was just my case, Charlie. My dream, or whatever you like to call it, was about a mutiny of the men. You don't say so, Charlie. So was mine. This is monstrously strange, to say the least of it. However, you tell your story first, and I'll tell mine. It was very short, Charlie said. We were at mess, not in our present mess room. We were dining at the fellows of some other regiment. Suddenly, without any warning, the windows were filled with a crowd of sepoys, who opened fire right and left into us. Half the fellows were shot down at once. The rest of us made a rush to our swords, just as the niggers came swarming into the room. There was a desperate fight for a moment. I remember that. Subadar Biran, one of the best native officers in the regiment, by the way, made a rush at me, and I shot him through the head with a revolver. At the same moment a ball hit me, and down I went. At the moment a sepoy fell dead across me, hiding me partly from sight. The fight lasted a minute or two, and I fancy a few fellows escaped, for I heard shots outside. Then the place became quiet. In another minute I heard a crackling, and saw that the devil sits at the mess-room on fire. One of our men, who was lying close by me, got up and crawled to the window, but he was shot down the moment he showed himself. I was hesitating whether to do the same, or to lie still and be smothered, when suddenly I rolled the dead sepoy off, crawled into the anteroom half suffocated by smoke, raised the lid of a very heavy trap-door, and stumbled down some steps into a place half storehouse, half cellar, under the mess-room. How I knew about it being there, I don't know. The trap closed over my head with a bang, and that's all I remember. Well, Charlie, curiously enough, my dream was almost about an extraordinary escape from danger, lasting like yours only a minute or two. The first thing I remember, there seems to have been something before, but that I don't know. I was on horseback, holding a very pretty but awfully pale girl in front of me. We were pursued by a whole troop of sepoy cavalry who were firing pistol-shots at us. 
We were not more than seventy or eighty yards in front, and they were gaining fast, just as I rode into a large deserted temple. In the centre was a huge stone figure. I jumped off my horse with the lady, and as I did so, she said, "'Blow out my brains, Edward! Don't let me fall into their hands!' Instead of answering, I hurried her round behind the idol, pushed against one of the leaves of a flower in the carving, and the stone swung back, and showed a hole just large enough to get through, with a stone staircase inside the body of the idol, made no doubt for the priest to go up and give responses through the mouth. I hurried the girl through, crept in after her, and closed the stone, just as our pursuers came clattering into the courtyard. And that's all I remember. "'Well, it's monstrously rum,' Charlie said after a pause. "'Did you understand what the old fellow was singing about before he gave us the pipes?' Uh, "'Yes, I, I caught the general drift. It was an, an entreaty to Siva to give us some glimpse of futurity which might benefit us.' "'Well, we lit our cheroots and rode for some miles at a brisk canter, without remark. When we were within a short distance of home, we reined up. "'I feel ever so much better,' Charlie said. "'We've got that opium out of our heads now. "'How do you account for it all, Harley?' "'Well, I account for it this way, Charlie. "'The opium naturally had the effect of making us both dream, "'and as we took similar doses of the same mixture under similar circumstances, "'it's scarcely extraordinary that it should have affected the same portion of the brain, "'and caused a certain similarity in our dreams. "'In all nightmares something terrible happens, or is on the point of happening, and so it was here. Not unnaturally, in both our cases, our thoughts turned to soldiers. If you remember, there was a talk at mess some little time since as to what would happen in the extremely unlikely event of the sepoys mutinying in a body. I have no doubt that was the foundation of both our dreams. It's all natural enough when we come to think it over calmly. I think, by the way, we had better agree to say nothing at all about it in the regiment. Oh, I should think not, Charlie said. We should never hear the end of it. It chaff us out of our lives. We kept our secret, and came at last to laugh over it heartily when we were together. Then the subject dropped, and by the end of a year had as much escaped our minds as any other dream would have done. Three months after the affair, the regiment was ordered down to Allahabad, and the change of place no doubt helped to erase all memory of the dream. Four years after we had left Jubalpur, we went to Virapur. The time is very marked in my memory, because the very week we arrived there, your aunt, then Miss Gardner, came out from England to her father, our colonel. The instant I saw her, I was impressed with the idea that I knew her intimately. I recollected her face, her figure, and the very tone of her voice. But wherever I had met her, I could not conceive. Upon the occasion of my first introduction to her, I could not help telling her that I was convinced that we had met, and asking her if she did not remember it. No, she did not remember, but very likely she might have done so, and she suggested the names of several people at whose houses we might have met. I did not know any of them. Presently she asked how long I had been out in India. Six years, I said. And how old, Mr. Harley, she said, do you take me to be? I saw in one instant my stupidity, and was stammering out an apology when she went on. I am very little over eighteen, Mr. Harley, although I evidently look ever so many years older. But Papa can certify to my age. So I was only twelve when you left England. I tried in vain to clear matters up. Your aunt would insist that I took her to be forty, and the fun that my blunder made rather drew us together, and gave me a start over the other fellows at the station, half of whom fell straightway in love with her. Some months went on, and when the mutiny broke out, we were engaged to be married. It's a proof of how completely the opium dreams have passed out of the minds of both Simmons and myself, that even when rumors of general dissatisfaction among the sepoys began to be current, they never once recurred to us. And even when the news of the actual mutiny reached us, we were just as confident as were the others of the fidelity of our own regiment. It was the old story, foolish confidence and black treachery. As at very many other stations the mutiny broke out when we were at mess, our regiment was dining with the 34th Bengalis. Suddenly, just as dinner was over, the window was opened, and a tremendous fire poured in. 
Four or five men fell dead at once, and the poor colonel who was next to me was shot right through the head. Every one rushed to his sword and drew his pistol, for we had been ordered to carry pistols as part of our uniform. I was next to Charlie Simmons, as the sepoys of both regiments, headed by Subadar Peran, poured in at the windows. "'I have it now,' Charlie said. "'It's the scene I dreamed.' As he spoke, he fired his revolver at the Subadar, who fell dead in his tracks. A sepoy close by leveled his musket and fired. Charlie fell, and the fellow rushed forward to bayonet him. As he did so, I sent a bullet through his head, and he fell across Charlie. It was a wild fight for a minute or two, and then a few of us made a sudden rush together, cut our way through the mutineers, and darted through an open window onto the parade. There were shouts, shots, and screams from the officer's bungalow, and in several places flames were already rising. What became of the other men I knew not. I made as hard as I could tear for the colonel's bungalow. Suddenly I came upon a sowar sitting on his horse watching the rising flames. Before he saw me I was on him and ran him through. I leapt on his horse and galloped down to Gardner's compound. I saw lots of sepoys in and around the bungalow all engaged in looting. I dashed into the compound. "'May! May!' I shouted. "'Where are you?' I had scarcely spoken before a dark figure rushed out of a clump of bushes close by with a scream of delight. In an instant she was on the horse before me, and, shooting down a couple of fellows who made a rush at my reins, I dashed out again. Stray shots were fired after us, but fortunately the sepoys were all busy looting. Most of them had laid down their muskets, and no one really took up the pursuit. I turned off from the parade ground, dashed down between the hedges of two compounds, and in another minute we were in the open country. Fortunately the cavalry were all down looting their own lines, or we must have been overtaken at once. May happily had fainted as I lifted her onto my horse, happily because the fearful screams that we heard from the various bungalows almost drove me mad, and would probably have killed her, for the poor ladies were all her intimate friends. I rode on for some hours till I felt quite safe from any immediate pursuit, and then we halted in the shelter of a clump of trees. By this time I'd heard May's story. She'd felt uneasy at being alone, but had laughed at herself for being so, until upon her speaking to one of the servants he had answered in a tone of gross insolence, which had astonished her. She had once guessed that there was danger, and the moment that she was alone caught up a large dark carriage rug, wrapped it round her so as to conceal her white dress, and stole out into the veranda. The night was dark, and scarcely had she left the house than she heard a burst of firing across at the mess-house. She at once ran in among the bushes and crouched there, as she heard the rush of men into the room she had just left. She heard them searching for her, but they were looking for a white dress, and her dark rug saved her. What she must have suffered in the five minutes between the firing of the first shots and my arrival she only knows. May has spoken but very little since we started. I believe that she was certain that her father was dead, although I had given an evasive answer which he asked me, and her terrible sense of loss, added to the horror of that time of suspense in the garden, had completely stunned her. We waited in the tope until the afternoon, and then set out again. We had gone but a short distance when we saw a body of the rebel cavalry in pursuit. They had no doubt been scouring the country generally and the discovery was accidental. For a short time we kept away from them, but this could not be for long, as our horse was carrying double. I made for a sort of ruin I saw at the foot of a hill half a mile away. I did so with no idea of the possibility of concealment. My intention was simply to get my back to a rock and to sell my life as dearly as I could, keeping the last two barrels of the revolver for ourselves. Certainly no remembrance of my dream influenced me in any way and in the wild whirl of excitement I had not given a second thought to Charlie Simmons' exclamation. As we rode up to the ruins, only a hundred yards ahead of us, May said, "'Blow out my brains, Edward! Don't let me fall alive into their hands!' A shock of remembrance shot across me. The chase, her pale face, the words, the temple, all my dream rushed into my mind. "'We are saved!' I cried to her amazement as we rode into the courtyard, in whose centre a great figure was sitting. I leapt from the horse, snatched the mastic of water from the saddle, and then hurried me round the idol, between which and the rock behind there was but just room to get along. Not a doubt entered my mind but that I should find the spring as I had dreamed, 
Sure enough, there was the carving, fresh upon my memory as if I had seen it but the day before. I placed my hand on the leaflet without hesitation. A solid stone moved back. I hurried my amazed companion in and shot to the stone. I found and shot to a massive bolt, evidently placed to prevent the door being opened by accident or design when any was in the idol. At first it seemed quite dark, but a faint light streamed in from above. We made our way up the stairs, and found that the light came through a number of small holes pierced into the upper part of the head, and through still smaller holes lower down, not much larger than a good-sized knitting needle could pass through. These holes, we afterwards found, were in the ornaments round the idol's neck. The holes enlarged inside, and enabled us to have a view all round. The mutineers were furious at our disappearance, and for hours searched about, then saying that we must be hidden somewhere, and that they would wait till we came out. They proceeded to bivouac in the courtyard of the temple. We passed four terrible days, but on the morning of the fifth a scout came in to tell the rebels that a column of British troops marching on Delhi would pass close by the temple. They therefore hastily mounted and galloped off. Three quarters of an hour later we were safe among our own people. A fortnight afterward your aunt and I were married. It was no time for ceremony then. There were no means of sending her away, no place where she could have waited until the time for her mourning for her father was over. So we were married quietly by one of the chaplains of the troops, and, as your story-books say, have lived very happily ever after. And how about Mr. Simmons, uncle? Did he get safe off too? Yes, his dream came as vividly to his mind as mine had done. He crawled to the place where he knew the trapdoor would be, and got into the cellar. Fortunately for him there were plenty of eatables there, and he lived there in concealment for a fortnight. After that he crawled out and found the mutineers had marched for Delhi. He went through a lot, but at last joined us before that city. We often talked over our dreams together, and there was no question that we owed our lives to them. Even then we did not talk much to other people about them, for there would have been a lot of talk and inquiry and questions, and you know fellows hate that sort of thing, so we held our tongues. Poor Charlie's silence was sealed a year later at Lucknow, for on the advance with Lord Clyde he was killed. And now, boys and girls, you must run off to bed. Five minutes more, and it'll be Christmas Day. So you see, Frank, that although I don't believe in ghosts, I have yet met with a circumstance which I cannot account for. It's very curious, anyhow, Uncle, and beats ghost stories into fits. I like it better, certainly, one of the girls said, for we can go to bed without being afraid of dreaming about it. Well, you must not talk any more now. Off to bed, off to bed, Colonel Harley said, or I shall get into terrible disgrace with your fathers and mothers, who have been looking very gravely at me for the last three quarters of an hour. White-Faced Dick, A Story of Pine Tree Gulch by G. A. Henty how Pine Tree Gulch got its name no one knew, for in the early days every ravine and hillside was thickly covered with pines. It may be that a tree of exceptional size caught the eye of the first explorer, that he camped under it, and named the place in its honor, or maybe some fallen giant lay in the bottom and hindered the work of the first prospectors. At any rate, Pine Tree Gulch it was, and the name was as good as any other. The pine trees were gone now cut up for firing, or for the erection of huts, or the construction of sluices, but the hillside was ragged with their stumps. The principal camp was at the mouth of the gulch, where the little stream, which scarce afforded water sufficient for the cradles in the dry season, but which was a rushing torrent in winter, joined the Yuba. The best ground was at the junction of the streams, and lay, indeed, in the Yuba Valley rather than in the gulch. At first most gold had been found higher up, but there was here comparatively little depth down to the bedrock, and as the ground became exhausted the miners moved down towards the mouth of the gulch. They were doing well as a whole, how well no one knew, for miners are chary of giving information as to what they are making. Still it was certain they were doing well, for the bars were doing a roaring trade, and the storekeepers never refused credit, a proof in itself that the prospects were good. The flat at the mouth of the gulch was a busy scene. Every foot was good-paying stuff, for in the eddy, where the torrents in winter rushed down into the Yuba, the gold had settled down and lay thick among the gravel. 
but most of the parties were sinking and it was a long way down to the bedrock for the hills on both sides sloped steeply and the yuba must here at one time have rushed through a narrow gorge until in some wild freak it brought down millions of tons of gravel and resumed its course seventy feet above its former level a quarter of a mile higher up a ledge of rock ran across the valley and over it in the old time the yuba had poured in a cascade seventy feet deep into the ravine but the rock now was level with the gravel only showing its jagged points here and there above it this ledge had been invaluable to the diggers without it they could only have sunk their shafts with the greatest difficulty for the gravel would have been full of water and even with the greatest pains in puddling and timber work the pumps would scarcely have sufficed to keep it down as it rose in the bottom of the shafts but the miners had made common cause together and giving each so many ounces of gold or so many days work had erected a dam thirty feet high along the ledge of rock and had cut a channel for the yuba along the lower slopes of the valley of course when the rain set in as everybody knew the dam would go and the river diggings must be abandoned till the water subsided and a fresh dam was made but there were two months before them yet and every one hoped to be down to the bedrock before the water interrupted their work the hillside both in the yuba valley and for some distance along pine tree gulch was dotted by shanties and tents the former constructed for the most part of logs roughly squared the walls being some three feet in height on which the sharp sloping roof was placed thatched in the first place with boughs and made all snug perhaps with an old sail stretched over all the camp was quiet enough during the day the few women were away with their washing at the pools a quarter of a mile up the gulch and the only persons to be seen about were the men told off for cooking for their respective parties but in the evening the camp was lively groups of men in red shirts and corded trousers tied at the knee in high boots sat round blazing fires and talked of their prospects or discussed the news of the luck at other camps the sound of music came from two or three plank erections which rose conspicuously above the huts of the diggers and were bright externally with the glories of white and colored paints to and from these men were always sauntering and it needed not the clink of glasses and the sound of music to tell that they were the bars of the camp here standing at the counter or seated at numerous small tables men were drinking villainous liquor smoking and talking and paying but scant attention to the strains of the fiddle or the accordion save when some well-known air was played when all would join in a boisterous chorus some were always passing in or out of a door which led into a room behind here there was comparative quiet for men were gambling and gambling high going backwards and forwards with liquors into the gambling room of the imperial saloon which stood just where pine tree gulch opened into yuba valley was a lad whose appearance had earned for him the name of white-faced dick white-faced dick was not one of those who had done well at pine tree gulch he had come across the plains with his father who had died when halfway over and dick had been thrown on the world to shift for himself nature had not intended him for the work for he was a delicate timid lad what spirits he originally had having been for years before beaten out of him by a brutal father so far indeed dick was the better rather than the worse for the event which had left him an orphan they had been travelling with a large party for mutual security against indians and mormons and so long as the journey lasted dick had got on fairly well he was always ready to do odd jobs and as the draft cattle were growing weaker and weaker and every pound of weight was of importance no one grudged him his rations in return for his services but when the company began to descend the slopes of the sierra nevada they began to break up going off by twos and threes to the diggings of which they heard such glowing accounts some however kept straight on to sacramento determining there to obtain news as to the doings at all the different places and then to choose that which seemed to them to offer the surest prospects of success dick proceeded with them to the town and there found himself alone his companions were absorbed in the busy rush of population and each had so much to provide and arrange for that none gave a thought to the solitary boy however at that time no one who had a pair of hands however feeble to work need starve in sacramento and for some weeks dick hung around the town doing odd jobs and then having saved a few dollars determined to try his luck at the diggings and started on foot with a shovel on his shoulders and a few days provisions slung across it 
Arrived at his destination, the lad soon discovered that gold digging was hard work for brawny and seasoned men, and after a few feeble attempts in spots abandoned as worthless he gave up the effort and again began to drift, and even in Pine Tree Gulch it was not difficult to get a living. At first he tried rocking cradles, but the work was far harder than it appeared. He was standing ankle-deep in water from morning till night, and his cheeks grew paler, and his strength, instead of increasing, seemed to fade away. Still there were jobs within his strength. He could keep a fire alight and watch a cooking pot, he could carry up buckets of water or wash a flannel shirt, and so he struggled on, until at last some kind-hearted man suggested to him that he should try to get a place at the new saloon which was about to be opened. "'You are not fit for this work, young'un, and you ought to be at home with your mother. If you like, I will go up with you this evening to Jeffreys. I knew him down on the flats, and I dare say he will take you on. I don't say as a saloon is a good place for a boy. Still, you will always get your belly full of victuals and a dry place to sleep in, if it's only under a table. What do you say?' Dick thankfully accepted the offer, and on Red George's recommendation was that evening engaged. His work was not hard now, for till the miners knocked off there was little doing in the saloon. A few men would come in for a drink at dinner time, but it was not until the lamps were lit that business began in earnest, and then for four or five hours Dick was busy. A rougher or healthier lad would not have minded the work, but to Dick it was torture. Every nerve in his body thrilled whenever rough miners cursed him for not carrying out their orders more quickly, or for bringing them the wrong liquors, which, as his brain was in a whirl with the noise, the shouting, and the multiplicity of orders, happened frequently. He might have fared worse had not Red George always stood his friend, and Red George was an authority in Pine Tree Gulch. Powerful in frame, reckless in bearing and temper, he had been in a score of fights and had come off them, if not unscathed, at least victorious. He was notoriously a lucky digger, but his earnings went as fast as they were made, and he was always ready to open his belt and give a bountiful pinch of dust to any mate down on his luck. One evening Dick was more helpless and confused than usual. The saloon was full, and he had been shouted at and badgered and cursed until he scarcely knew what he was doing. High play was going on in the saloon, and a good many men were clustered round the table. Red George was having a run of luck, and there was a big pile of gold dust on the table before him. One of the gamblers who was losing had ordered old rye, and instead of bringing it to him, Dick brought a tumbler of hot liquor which someone else had called for. With an oath the man took it up and threw it in his face. "'You cowardly hound!' Red George exclaimed. "'Are you man enough to do that to a man?' "'You bet!' the gambler, who was a new arrival at Pine Tree Gulch, replied. And picking up an empty glass, he hurled it at Red George. The bystanders sprang aside, and in a moment the two were facing each other with outstretched pistols. The two reports rung out simultaneously. Red George sat down unconcernedly with a streak of blood flowing down his face, where the bullet had cut a furrow in his cheek. The stranger fell back with a bullet hole in the center of his forehead. The body was carried outside, and the play continued as if no interruption had taken place. They were accustomed to such occurrences in Pine Tree Gulch, and the piece of ground at the top of the hill that had been set aside as a burial place was already dotted thickly with graves, filled in almost every instance by men who had died, in the local phraseology, with their boots on. Neither then nor afterwards did Red George allude to the subject to Dick, whose life after this signal instance of his championship was easier than it had hitherto been, for there were few in Pine Tree Gulch who cared to excite Red George's anger, and strangers going to the place were sure to receive a friendly warning that it was best for their health to keep their tempers over any shortcomings on the part of white-faced Dick. Grateful as he was for Red George's interference on his behalf, Dick felt the circumstances which had ensued more than anyone else in the camp. With others it was the subject of five minutes' talk, but Dick could not get out of his head the thought of the dead man's face as he fell back. He had seen many such frays before, but he was too full of his own troubles for them to make much impression upon him. But in the present case he felt as if he himself was responsible for the death of the gambler. If he had not blundered, this would not have happened. He wondered whether the dead man had a wife and children, and if so, were they expecting his return? Would they ever hear where he had died, and how? 
but this feeling which tired out as he was when the time came for closing the bar often prevented him from sleeping for hours in no way lessened his gratitude and devotion towards red george and he felt that he could die willingly if his life would benefit his champion sometimes he thought too that his life would not be much to give for in spite of shelter and food the cough which he had caught while working in the water still clung to him and as his employer said to him angrily one day your victuals don't do you no good dick you get thinner and thinner and folks will think as i starve you darned if you ain't a disgrace to the establishment the wind was whistling down the gorges and the clouds hung among the pine woods which still clothed the upper slopes of the hills and the diggers as they turned out one morning looked up apprehensively but it could not be they assured each other every one knew that the rains were not due for another month yet it could only be a passing shower if it rained at all but as the morning went on men came in from camps higher up the river and reports were current that it had been raining for the last two days among the upper hills while those who took the trouble to walk across to the new channel could see for themselves at noon that it was filled very nigh to the brim the water rushing along with thick and turbid current but those who repeated the rumors or who reported that the channel was full were summarily put down men would not believe that such a calamity as a flood and the destruction of all their season's work could be impending there had been some showers no doubt as there had often been before but it was ridiculous to talk of anything like rain a month before its time still in spite of these assertions there was uneasiness at pine tree gulch and men looked at the driving clouds above and shook their heads before they went down to the shafts to work after dinner when the last customer had left and the bar was closed dick had nothing to do till evening and he wandered outside and sat down on a stump at first looking at the work going on in the valley then so absorbed in his own thoughts that he noticed nothing not even the driving mist which presently set in he was calculating that he had with his savings from his wages and what had been given him by the miners laid by eighty dollars when he got another hundred and twenty he would go he would make his way down to san francisco and then by ship to panama and up to new york and then west again to the village where he was born there would be people there who would know him and who would give him work for his mother's sake he did not care what it was anything would be better than this then his thoughts came back to pine tree gulch and he started to his feet could he be mistaken were his eyes deceiving him no among the stones and boulders of the old bed of the yuba there was the gleam of water and even as he watched it he could see it widening out he started to run down the hill to give the alarm but before he was halfway he paused for there were loud shouts and a scene of bustle and confusion instantly arose the cradles were deserted and the men working on the surface loaded themselves with their tools and made for the high ground while those at the windlasses worked their hardest to draw up their comrades below a man coming down from above stopped close to dick with a low cry and stood gazing with a white scared face dick had worked with him he was one of the company to which red george belonged what is it saunders my god they are lost the man replied i was at the windlass when they shouted up to me to go up and fetch them a bottle of rum they had just struck it rich and wanted a drink on the strength of it dick understood at once red george and his mates were still in the bottom of the shaft ignorant of the danger which was threatening them come on he cried we shall be in time yet and at the top of his speed dashed down the hill followed by saunders what is it what is it asked parties of men mounting the hill red george's gang are still below dick's eyes were fixed on the water there was a broad band now of yellow with a white edge down the center of the stony flat and it was widening with terrible rapidity it was scarce ten yards from the windlass at the top of red george's shaft when dick followed closely by saunders reached it come up mates quick for your lives the river is rising you will be flooded out directly every one else has gone as he spoke he pulled up the rope by which the bucket was hanging and the handles of the windlass flew round rapidly as it descended when it had run out dick and he grasped the handles all right below an answering call came up and the two began their work throwing their whole strength into it quickly as the windlass revolved it seemed an endless time to dick before the bucket came up and the first man stepped out it was not red george dick had hardly expected it would be 
red george would be sure to see his two mates up before him and the man uttered a cry of alarm as he saw the water now within a few feet of the mouth of the shaft it was a torrent now for not only was it coming through the dam but it was rushing down in cascades from the new channel without a word the miner placed himself facing dick and the moment the bucket was again down the three grasped the handles but quickly as they worked the edge of the water was within a few inches of the shaft when the next man reached the surface but again the bucket descended before the rope tightened however the water had begun to run over the lip at first in a mere trickle and then almost instantaneously in a cascade which grew larger and larger the bucket was halfway up when a sound like thunder was heard the ground seemed to tremble under their feet and then at the turn of the valley above a great wave of yellow water crested with foam was seen tearing along at the speed of a racehorse the dam has burst saunders shouted run for your lives or we are all lost the three men dropped the handles and ran at full speed towards the shore while loud shouts to dick to follow came from the crowd of men standing on the slope but the boy grasped the handles and with lips tightly closed still toiled on slowly the bucket ascended for red george was a heavy man then suddenly the weight slackened and the handle went round faster the shaft was filling the water had reached the bucket and had risen to red george's neck so that his weight was no longer on the rope so fast did the water pour in that it was not half a minute before the bucket reached the surface and red george sprang out there was but time for one exclamation and then the great wave struck them red george was whirled like a straw in the current but he was a strong swimmer and at a point where the valley widened out half a mile lower he struggled to shore two days later the news reached pine tree gulch that a boy's body had been washed ashore twenty miles down and ten men headed by red george went and brought it solemnly back to pine tree gulch there among the stumps of pine trees a grave was dug and there in the presence of the whole camp white-faced dick was laid to rest pine tree gulch is a solitude now the trees are growing again and none would dream that it was once a busy scene of industry but if the traveller searches among the pine trees he will find a stone with the words here lies white-faced dick who died to save red george what can a man do more than give his life for a friend the text was the suggestion of an ex-clergyman working as a miner in pine tree gulch red george worked no more at the diggings but after seeing the stone laid in its place went east and with what little money came to him when the common fund of the company was divided after the flood on the yuba bought a small farm and settled down there but to the end of his life he was never weary of telling those who would listen to it the story of pine tree gulch end of white faced dick by g a henty a brush with the chinese by g a henty it was early in December that H.M.S. Perseus was cruising off the mouth of the Canton River. War had been declared with China in consequence of her continued evasions of the treaty she had made with us, and it was expected that a strong naval force would soon gather to bring her to reason. In the meantime, the ships on the station had a busy time of it, chasing the enemy's junks when they ventured to show themselves beyond the reach of the guns of their forts, and occasionally having a brush with the piratical boats which took advantage of the general confusion to plunder friend as well as foe. The Perseus had that afternoon chased two government junks up a creek. The sun had already set when they took refuge there, and the captain did not care to send his boats after them in the dark, as many of the creeks ran up for miles into the flat country, and as they were not unfrequently had many arms or branches, the boats might in the dark miss the junk altogether. Orders were issued that four boats should be ready for starting at daybreak the next morning. The Perseus anchored off the mouth of the creek, and two boats were ordered to row backwards and forwards off its mouth all night, to ensure that the enemy did not slip out in the darkness. Jack Fothergill, the senior midshipman, was commanding the gig, and two of the other midshipmen were going in the pinnace and the launch, commanded respectively by the first lieutenant and the master. The three other midshipmen of the Perseus were loud in their lamentations that they were not to take share in the fun. "'You can't all go, you know,' Father Gill said. "'And it's no use making a row about it. "'The captain has been very good to let us three go.' "'It's all very well for you, Jack,' Percy Adcock, the youngest of the lads, said. "'Because 
You, of course, are one of those chosen, and it's not so hard for Simmons and Linthrop, because they went the other day in the boat that chased those junks under shelter of the guns of their battery. But I haven't had a chance for ever so long. Eh, what fun was there in chasing the junks, Simmons says. We never got near to the brutes till they were close to their battery, and then, just as the first shot came singing from their guns, and we thought that we were going to have some excitement. The first lieutenant sung out, Easy all, and there was nothing for it but to turn around and to row for the ship. What a nice hot row it was, two hours and a half in a broiling sun. Of course, I'm not blaming Oliphant, for the captain's orders were strict that we were not to try to cut the chunks out if they got under the guns of any of their batteries. Still, it was horribly annoying, and I do think the captain might have remembered that beastly luck we had last time and given us a chance tomorrow. It's clear we could not all go, Father Gill said, and naturally enough the captain chose the three seniors. Besides, if you did have bad luck last time, you had your chance, and I don't suppose we shall have anything more exciting now. These fellows always set fire to their junks and row for the shore directly they see us, after firing a shot or two wildly in our direction. Well, Jack, if you don't expect any fun, Simmons replied, perhaps you wouldn't mind telling the first lieutenant you do not care for going and that I am very anxious to take your place. Perhaps he'll be good enough to allow me to relieve you. <laughs> a likely thing that, Father Gill replied. No, Tom, I'm sorry you're not going, but you must make the best of it till another chance comes. Don't you think, Jack, Percy Adcock said to his senior in a coaxing tone later on, you could manage to smuggle me into the boat with you? Not I, Percy. Suppose you got hurt, what would the captain say then? and firing as wildly as the Chinese do, a shot is just as likely to hit your little carcass as to lodge in one of the sailors. No, you must just make the best of it, Percy, and I promise you that next time there's a boat expedition, if you're not put in, I will say a good word to the first bluff for you. That promise is better than nothing, the boy said, but I would a deal rather go this time and take my chance next. But you see, you can't, Percy, and there's no use talking any more about it. I really do not expect there'll be any fighting. Two junks would hardly make any opposition to the boats of the ship, and I expect we shall be back by nine o'clock with news that they were well on fire before we came up. Percy Adcock, however, was determined, if possible, to go. He was a favorite among the men, and when he spoke to the bow oar of the gig, the latter promised to do anything he could to aid him to carry out his wishes. We're to start at daybreak, Tom, so that it will be quite dark when the boats are lowered. I'll creep into the gig before that and hide myself as well as I can under your thwart. And all you have to do is to take no notice of me. When the boat is lowered, I think they'll hardly make me out from the deck, especially as you'll be standing up in the bow holding on with the boat hook till the rest get on board. Well, sir, I'll do my best. But if you're caught, you must not let out that I knew anything about it. Oh, I won't do that, Percy said. I don't think there's much chance of my being noticed until we get on board the junks, and then they won't know which boat I came off in, and the first lieutenant will be too busy to blow me up. Of course, I shall get it when I'm on board again, but I don't mind that, so that I see the fun. Besides, I want to send home some things to my sister, and she'll like them all the better if I can tell her I captured them on board some junks we seized and burnt. The next morning the crew mustered before daybreak, Percy had already taken his place under the bow thwart of the gig. The davits were swung overboard, and two men took their places in her as she was lowered down by the falls. As soon as she touched the water, the rest of the crew clambered down by the ladder and took their places. Then Fothergill took his seat in the stern, and the boat pushed off and lay a few lengths away from the ship until the heavier boats put off. As soon as they were under way, Percy crawled out from his hiding place and placed himself in the bow where he was sheltered by the body of the oarsman from Fothergill's sight. Day was just breaking now, but it was still dark on the water, and the boat rowed very slowly until it became lighter. Percy could just make out the shores of the creek on both sides. They were put two or three feet above the level of the water, and were evidently submerged at high tide. The creek was about a hundred yards wide, and the lad could not see far ahead for it was full of sharp windings and turns. Here and there branches joined it, but the boats were evidently following the main channel. After another half-hour's rowing, the first lieutenant suddenly gave the order, Easy all, 
and the men, looking over their shoulders, saw a village a quarter of a mile ahead, with the two junks they had chased the night before lying in front of it. Almost at the same moment a sudden uproar was heard. Drums were beaten and gongs sounded. "'They're on the lookout for us,' the first lieutenant said. "'Mr. Mason, do you keep with me and attack the junk highest up the river? Mr. Bellew and Mr. Fothergill, you do take the one lower down. Row on, men.' The oars all touched the water together, and the four boats leaped forward. In a minute a scattering fire of gingles and matchlocks was opened from the junks, and the bullets pattered on the water round the boats. Percy was kneeling up in the bow now, as they passed a branch channel three or four hundred yards from the village. He started and leaped to his feet. "'There are four or five junks in that passage, Father Gill. They're poling out.' The first lieutenant heard the words, "'Row on, men, let us finish with these craft ahead before the others get out. This must be that piratical village we've heard about, Mr. Mason, as lying up one of these creeks. That accounts for those two junks not going higher up. I was surprised at seeing them here, for they might guess that we should try to get them this morning. Evidently they calculated on catching us in a trap. Percy was delighted at finding that in the excitement caused by his news the first lieutenant had forgotten to take any notice of his being there without orders, and he returned a defiant nod to the threat conveyed by Fothergill, shaking his fist at him. As they neared the junks the fire of those on board redoubled and was aided by that of many villagers gathering on the bank of the creek. Suddenly from a bank of rushes four cannons were fired. A ball struck the pinnace, smashing in her side. The other boats gathered hastily round and took her crew on board, and then dashed at the junks, which were but a hundred yards distant. The valor of the Chinese evaporated as they saw the boats approaching, and scores of them leaped overboard and swam for shore. In another minute the boats were alongside, and the crews scrambling up the sides of the junks. A few Chinamen only attempted to oppose them. These were speedily overcome, and the British had now time to look round, and saw that six junks crowded with men had issued from the side creek and were making towards them. Let the boats tow astern, the lieutenant ordered. We should have to run the gauntlet of that battery on shore if we were to attack them, and might lose another boat before we reach their side. We'll fight them here. The junks approached, those on board firing their guns, yelling and shouting, while the drums and gongs were furiously beaten. They'll find themselves mistaken, Percy, if they think they're going to frighten us with all that row, Father Gill said. You young rascal, how did you get on board the boat without being seen? The captain will be sure to suspect I had a hand in concealing you. The tars were now at work firing the gingles attached to the bulwarks, and the matchlocks with which the deck was strewn at the approaching junks. As they took steady aim, leaning their pieces on the bulwarks, they did considerable execution among the Chinamen crowded on board the junks, while the shot of the Chinese for the most part whistled far overhead. But the guns of the shore battery, which had now slewed round to bear upon them, opened with a better aim, and several shots came crashing into the sides of the two captured junks. "'Get ready to board, lads,' Lieutenant Oliphant shouted. "'Don't wait for them to board you, but the moment they come alongside, lash their rigging to ours and spring on board them.' The leading junk was now about twenty yards away, and presently grated alongside. Half a dozen sailors at once sprang into her rigging with ropes, and after lashing the junks together leaped down upon her deck, where Fothergill was leading the gig's crew and some of those rescued from the pinnace, while Mr. Ballou, with another party, had boarded her at the stern. Several of the Chinese fought stoutly, but the greater part lost heart at seeing themselves attacked by the white devils, instead of, as they expected, overwhelming them by their superior numbers. Many began at once to jump overboard, and after two or three minutes' sharp fighting, the rest either followed their example or were beaten below. Fothergill looked round. The other junk had been attacked by two of the enemy, one on each side, and the little body of sailors were gathered in her waist and were defending themselves against an overwhelming number of the enemy. The other three piratical junks had been carried somewhat up the creek by the tide that was sweeping inward, and could not for the moment take part in the fight. "'Mr. Oliphant's hard-pressed, sir,' he asked the master. "'Shall we take to the boats?' "'That will be the best plan,' Mr. Ballou replied. "'Quick, lads, get the boats alongside and tumble in. There's not a moment to be lost.' The crew at once sprang to the boats and rowed to the other junk, which was but some thirty yards away. The Chinese, absorbed in their contest with the crew of the pinnace, did not perceive the newcomers until they gained the deck. 
and with a shout fell furiously upon them. In their surprise and consternation the pirates did not pause to note that they were still five to one superior in number, but made a precipitate rush for their own vessels. The English at once took the offensive. The first lieutenant with his party boarded one, while the newcomers leaped on to the deck of the other. The panic which had seized the Chinese was so complete that they attempted no resistance whatever, but sprang overboard in great numbers and swam to the shore, which was but twenty yards away, and in three minutes the English were in undisputed possession of both vessels. "'Back again, Mr. Fothergill, or you'll lose the craft you captured,' Lieutenant Oliphant said. "'They've already cut her free. The Chinese, indeed, who had been beaten below by the boarding party, had soon perceived the sudden departure of their captors, and gaining the deck again had cut the lashings which fastened them to the other junk, and were proceeding to hoist their sails. But they were too late, however. Almost before the craft had way on her, Fothergill and his crew were alongside. The Chinese did not wait for the attack, but at once sprang overboard and made for the shore. The other three junks, seeing the capture of their comrades, had already hoisted their sails and were making up the creek. Fothergill dropped an anchor, left four of his men in charge, and rode back to Mr. Oliphant. "'What shall we do next, sir?' "'Well, we'll give those fellows on shore a lesson and silence their battery. Two men have been killed since you left. We must let the other junks go for the present. Four of my men were killed and eleven wounded before Mr. Ballou and you came to our assistance. The Chinese were fighting pluckily up to that time, and it would have gone very hard with us if you had not been at hand. The beggars will fight when they think they have got it all their own way. But before we land we'll set fire to the five junks we've taken. Do you return and see that the two astern are well lighted, Mr. Fothergill? Mr. Mason will see to these three. When you've done your work, take to your boat and lay off till I join you. Keep the junks between you and the shore to protect you from the fire of the rascals. I cannot come with you, I suppose, Fothergill, Percy Adcock said, as the midshipman was about to descend into his boat again. Ah, oh, yes, come along, Percy. It doesn't matter what you do now. The captain will be so pleased when he hears that we've captured and burnt five junks that you'll get off with a very light wigging, I imagine. Yes, that's just what I was thinking, Jack. Has it not been fun? You wouldn't have thought it fun if you'd got one of those matchlock balls in your body. There are a good many of our poor fellows just at present moment who do not see anything funny in the affair at all. Here we are. Clamber up. The crew soon set to work under Father Gill's orders. The sails were cut off the masts and thrown down into the hold. Bamboos, of which there were an abundance down there, were heaped over them. A barrel of oil was poured over the mass, and the fire then applied. "'That will do, lads. Now take to your boats, and let's make a bonfire of the other junk.' In ten minutes both vessels were a sheet of flame, and the boat was lying a short distance from them, waiting for further operations. The inhabitants of the village, furious at the failure of the plan which had been laid for the destruction of the white devils, kept up a constant fusillade, which, however, did no harm, for the gig was completely sheltered by the burning junks close to her from their missiles. "'There go the others!' Percy exclaimed after a minute or two, as three columns of smoke arose simultaneously from the other junks, and the sailors were seen dropping into their boats alongside. The killed and wounded were placed in the other gig with four sailors in charge. They were directed to keep under shelter of the junks until rejoined by the pinnace and Fothergill's gig, after these had done their work on shore. When all was ready, the first lieutenant raised his hand as a signal, and the two boats dashed between the burning junks and rowed for the shore. Such of the natives as had their weapons charged fired a hasty volley, and then, as the sailors leapt from their boats, took to their heels. Mr. Fothergill, take your party into the village and set fire to the houses. Shoot down every man you see. This place is a nest of pirates. I will capture that battery and then join you. Fothergill and his sailors at once entered the village. The men had already fled. The women were turned out of the houses, and these were immediately set on fire. The tars regarded the whole affair as a glorious joke, and raced from house to house, making a hasty search in each for concealed valuables, before setting it on fire. In a short time the whole village was in a blaze. "'There's a house there, standing in that little grove a hundred yards away,' Percy said. "'It looks like a temple,' Fothergill replied. "'However, we'll have a look at it.' 
and calling two sailors to accompany him, he started at a run towards it, Percy keeping by his side. "'It is a temple,' Fothergill said when they approached it. "'Still, we'll have a look at it, but we won't burn it. It'll be as well to respect the religion even of a set of piratical scoundrels like these.' At the head of his men he rushed in at the entrance. There was a blaze of fire as half a dozen muskets were discharged in their faces. One of the sailors dropped dead, and before the others had time to realize what had happened, they were beaten to the ground by a storm of blows from swords and other weapons. A heavy blow crashed down on Percy's head, and he fell insensible even before he realized what had occurred. When he recovered, his first sensation was that of a vague wonder as to what had happened to him. He seemed to be in darkness, and unable to move hand or foot. He was compressed in some way that he could not at first understand and was being bumped and jolted in an extraordinary manner. It was some little time before he could understand the situation. He first remembered the fight with the chunks, then he recalled the landing and burning of the village. Then, as his brain cleared, came the recollection of his start with Father Gill for the temple among the trees, his arrival there, and a loud report and flash of fire. "'I must have been knocked down and stunned,' Percy said to himself. And I suppose I am a prisoner now to these brutes. One of them must be carrying me on his back. Yes, he could understand it all now. His hands and feet were tied, ropes were passed round his body in every direction, and he was fastened back to back upon the shoulders of a Chinaman. Percy remembered the tales he had heard of the imprisonment and torture of those who fell into the hands of the Chinese, and he bitterly regretted that he had not been killed instead of stunned in the surprise of the temple. It would have been just the same feeling, he said to himself, and there would have been an end to it. Now there's no saying what's going to happen. I wonder whether Jack was killed. Oh, and the sailors. Presently there was a jabber of voices, the motion ceased. Percy could feel that the cords were being unwound, and he was dropped onto his feet. Then the cloth was removed from his head, and he could look around. A dozen Chinese, armed with matchlocks and bristling with swords and daggers, stood round, and among them, bound like himself, and gagged by a piece of bamboo forced lengthwise across his mouth, and kept there with a string going round the back of the head, stood Father Gill. He was bleeding from several cuts in the head. Percy's heart gave a bound of joy at finding that he was not alone. Then he tried to feel sorry that Jack had not escaped, but failed to do so, although he told himself that his comrades present would not in any way alleviate the fate which was certain to befall him. Still, the thought of companionship, even in wretchedness, and perhaps a vague hope that Jack, with his energy and spirit, might contrive some way for their escape, cheered him up. As Percy, too, was gagged, no word could be exchanged by the midshipmen, but they nodded to each other. They were now put side by side and made to walk in the centre of their captors. On the way they passed through several villages, whose inhabitants poured out to gaze at the captives but the men in charge of them were evidently not disposed to delay, as they passed through without a stop. At last they halted before two cottages, standing by themselves, thrust the prisoners into a small room, removed their gags, and left them entirely to themselves. "'Well, Percy, my boy, so they caught you, too. I'm awfully sorry. It was my fault for going with only two men into that temple, but as the village had been deserted and scarcely a man was found there, it never entered my mind that there might be a party in the temple. Of course not, Jack. It was a surprise altogether. I don't know anything about it, for I was knocked down, I suppose, just as we went in. And the first thing I knew about it was that I was being carried on the back of one of these fellows. I thought it was awful at first, but I don't seem to mind so much now you're with me. It is a comfort to have someone to speak to, Jack said. Yet I wish you were not here, Percy. I can't do you any good and I shall never cease blaming myself for having brought you into this scrape. I don't know much more about the affair than you do. The guns were fired so close to us that my face was scorched with one of them, and almost at the same instant I got a lick across my cheek with a sword. I had just time to hit at one of them, and then almost at the same moment I got two or three other blows, and down I went. They threw themselves on the top of me and tied and gagged me in no time. Then I was tied to a long bamboo, and two fellows put the ends on their shoulders, and went off with me through the fields. Of course I was face downwards, and did not know you were with us till they stopped and loosed me from the bamboo and set me on my feet. But what are they going to do with us, do you think, Jack? 
I should say they are going to take us to Canton and claim a reward for our capture, and there, I suppose, they will cut off our heads, or saw us in two, or put us to some other unpleasant kind of death. I expect they are discussing it now. Do you hear what a jabber they are kicking up? Voices were indeed heard raised in angry altercation in the next room. After a time the din subsided, and the conversation appeared to take a more amiable turn. "'I suppose they've settled it as far as they're concerned,' Jack said. "'Anyhow, you may be quite sure that they mean to make something out of us. "'If they hadn't, they would have finished us at once, "'for they must have been furious at the destruction of their junks in the village. "'As to the idea that mercy has anything to do with it, "'we may as well put that out of our minds. "'The Chinaman, at the best of times, has no feeling of pity in his nature.' and after their defeat it's certain they would have killed us at once had they not hoped to do better by us. If they'd been Indians, I should have said they'd carried us off to enjoy the satisfaction of torturing us, but I don't suppose it's that way with them. Do you think there's any chance of our getting away? Percy asked, after a pause. I should say not the least in the world, Percy. My hands are fastened so tight now that the ropes seem cutting into my wrists and after they set me on my feet and cut the cords of my legs I could scarcely stand at first. My feet were so numbed by the pressure. However, we must keep up our pluck. Possibly they may keep us at Canton for a bit, and if they do the squadron may arrive and fight its way past the forts and take the city, before they have quite made up their minds as to what kind of death will be most appropriate to the occasion. I wonder what they are doing now. They seem to be chopping sticks. "'I wish they'd give us some water,' Percy said. "'I'm frightfully thirsty.' "'So am I, Percy. There is one comfort. They won't let us die of thirst. They could get no satisfaction out of our deaths now.' Two hours later some of the Chinese re-entered the room and led the captives outside, and the lads then saw what was the meaning of the noise they'd heard. A cage had been manufactured of strong bamboos. It was about four and a half feet long, four feet wide, and less than three feet high. Above it was fastened two long bamboos. Two or three of the bars of the cage had been left open. "'My goodness, they never intend to put us in there,' Percy exclaimed. "'That they do,' Jack said. "'They're going to carry us the rest of the way.' The cords, which bound the prisoners' hands, were now cut, and they were motioned to crawl into the cage. This they did. The bars were then put in their places and securely lashed. Four men went to the ends of the poles and lifted the cage upon their shoulders. Two others took their places beside it, and one man, apparently the leader of the party, walked on ahead. The rest remained behind. I never quite realized what a fowl felt in a cage before, Jack said, but if its sensations are at all like mine, they must be decidedly unpleasant. It isn't high enough to sit upright in, it's nothing like long enough to lie down, and as to getting out, one might as well think of flying. Do you know, Percy, I don't think they mean taking us to Canton at all. I did not think of it before, but from the direction of the sun I feel sure that we cannot have been going that way. What they are up to I can't imagine. In an hour they came to a large village. Here the cage was set down and the villagers closed round. They were, however, kept a short distance from the cage by the men in charge of it. Then a wooden platter was placed on the ground, and persons throwing a few copper coins into this were allowed to come near the cage. <laughs> they're making a show of us, Father Gill explained. That's what they're up to. You see if it isn't. They're going to travel up country to show the white devils whom their valor has captured. This was indeed the purpose of the pirates. At that time Europeans seldom ventured beyond the limits assigned to them in the two or three towns where they were permitted to trade, and few indeed of the country people had ever obtained a sight of the white barbarians, of whose doings they had so frequently heard. Consequently a small crowd soon gathered round the cage, eyeing the captives with the same interest they would have felt as to unknown and dangerous beasts. They laughed and joked, passed remarks upon them, and even poked them with sticks. Fothergill, furious at this treatment, caught one of the sticks, and wrenching it from the hands of the Chinaman, tried to strike at him through the bars, a proceeding which excited shouts of laughter from the bystanders. "'I think, Jack,' Percy said, "'it will be best to try and keep our tempers, and not to seem to mind what they do to us. 
Then, if they find they can't get any fun out of us, they'll soon leave us alone. Well, of course, that's the best plan, Father Gill agreed, but it's not so easy to follow. That fellow very nearly poked out my eye with his stick, and no one's going to stand that if he can help it. It was some hours before the curiosity of the village was satisfied. When all had paid who were likely to, the guards broke up their circle, and, leaving two of their number at the cage to see that no actual harm was caused to their prisoners, the rest went off to a refreshment house. The place of the elders was now taken by the boys and children of the village, who crowded round the cage, prodded the prisoners with sticks, and, putting their hands through the bars, pulled their ears and hair. This amusement, however, was brought to an abrupt conclusion by Fothergill suddenly seizing the wrist of a big boy, and pulling his arm through the cage, until his face was against the bars. Then he proceeded to punch him, until the guard, coming to his rescue, poked Fothergill with his stick until he released his hold. The punishment of their comrade excited neither anger nor resentment among the other boys, who yelled with delight at his discomfiture, but it made them more careful in approaching the cage and though they continued to poke the prisoners with sticks, they did not venture again to thrust a hand through the bars. At sunset the guards again came round, lifted the cage, and carried it into a shed. A platter of dirty rice and a jug of water was put into the cage. Two of the men lighted their long pipes and sat down on guard beside it, and, the other doors being closed, the captives were left in peace. If this sort of thing is to go on, as I suppose it is, Father Gill said, the sooner they cut off our heads, the better. It is very bad, Jack. I'm sore all over with those probes from their sharp sticks. Well, I don't care for the pain, Percy, so much as the humiliation of the thing, to be stared at and poked at as if we were wild beasts by these curs, when with half a dozen of our men we could send a hundred of them scampering. I feel as if I could choke with rage. You'd better try and eat some of this rice, Jack. It's beastly, but I dare say we shall get no more until tomorrow night, and we must keep up our strength if we can. At any rate, the water's not bad. That's a comfort. No thanks to them, Jack growled. If there had been any bad water in the neighborhood, they would have given it to us. For two weeks the sufferings of the prisoners continued. Their captors avoided towns where the authorities would probably at once have taken the prisoners out of their hands. No one would have recognized the two captives as the midshipmen of the Perseus. Their clothes were in rags, torn to pieces by the thrusts of the sharp-pointed bamboos to which they had daily been subjected. The bad food, the cramped position, and the misery which they suffered had worn both lads to skeletons. Their hair was matted with filth, their faces begrimed with dirt. Percy was so weak that he felt he could not stand. Fothergill, being three years older, was less exhausted, but he knew that he, too, could not support his sufferings for many days longer. Their bodies were covered with sores, and try as they would, they were able to catch only a few minutes' sleep at a time. So much did the bamboo bars hurt their wasted limbs. They seldom exchanged a word during the daytime, suffering in silence the persecutions to which they were exposed, but at night they talked over their homes and friends in England, and their comrades on board ship seldom saying a word as to their present position. They were now in a hilly country, but had not the least idea of the direction in which it lay from Canton or its distance from the coast. One evening Jack said to his companion, "'I think it's nearly all over now, Percy. The last two days we have made longer journeys, and have not stopped at any of the smaller villages we passed through. I fancy our guards must see that we can't last much longer.' and are taking us down to some town to hand us over to the authorities and get their rewards for us. I hope it is so, Jack. The sooner the better. Not that it makes much difference now to me, for I do not think I can stand many more days of it. I am afraid I am tougher than you, Percy, and shall take longer to kill, so I hope with all my heart that I may be right, and that they may be going to give us up to the authorities. The next evening they stopped at a large place and were subjected to the usual persecution. This, however, was now less prolonged than during the early days of their captivity, for they had now no longer strength or spirits to resent their treatment, and as no fun was to be obtained from passive victims, even the village boys soon ceased to find any amusement in tormenting them. 
when most of their visitors had left them, an elderly Chinaman approached the side of the cage. He spoke to their guard and looked at them attentively for some minutes, then said in pidgin English, "'You officer men?' "'Yes,' Jack exclaimed, starting at the sound of the English words, the first they'd heard spoken since their captivity. "'Yes, we are officers of the Perseus.' "'Me speak English really well,' the Chinaman said. "'Me pilot man, many years on Canton River. How you get here?' We were attacking some piratical junks and landed to destroy the village where the people were firing on us. We entered a place full of pirates and were knocked down and taken prisoners and carried away up the country. That's some six weeks ago, and you see what we are now. Pirate men very bad, the Chinaman said. Thunder many chunk on river and kill crew. Me much he hate them. Can you do anything for us? Jack asked. You will be well rewarded if you could manage to get us free. The man shook his head. Me no see what can do. Me stranger here come to stay with wifey. People no do what me ask them. English ships attack Canton. Much fight and take town. People all hate English. Bad country this. People in one village fight against another. Very bad men here. How far is Canton away? Jack asked. Could you not send down to tell the English we are here? Fourteen days' journey off, the man said. No see how can do anything. Well, Jack said, when you get back again to Canton, let our people know what has been the end of us. We shall not last much longer. All right, the man said. We'll see what we can do. Much he think tonight. And after saying a few words to the guards, who had been regarding this conversation with an air of surprise, the Chinaman retired. The guards had for some time abandoned the precaution of sitting up at night by the cage, convinced that their captives had no longer strength to attempt to break through its fastenings, or to drag themselves many yards away if they could do so. They therefore left it standing in the open, and, wrapping themselves in their thickly wadded coats, for the nights were cold, lay down by the side of the cage. The coolness of the nights had indeed assisted to keep the two prisoners alive. During the day the sun was excessively hot, and the crowd of visitors round the cage impeded the circulation of the air, and added to their sufferings. It was true that the cold at night frequently prevented them from sleeping, but it acted as a tonic and braced them up. What did he mean about the villages attacking each other? Percy asked. I have heard, Jack replied, that in some parts of China things are very much the same as they used to be in the highlands of Scotland. There is no law or order. The different villages are like clans and wage war on each other. Sometimes the government sends a number of troops who put the thing down for a time, chop off a good many heads, and then march away, and the whole work begins again as soon as their backs are turned. That night the uneasy slumber of the lads was disturbed by a sudden firing. Shouts and yells were heard, and the firing redoubled. The village is attacked, Jack said. I notice that, like some other places we have come into lately, there's a strong earthen wall round it with gates. Well, there is one comfort. It does not make much difference to us which side wins. The guards at the first alarm leaped to their feet, caught up their matchlocks, and ran to aid in the defense of the wall. Two minutes later a man ran up to the cage. Oh, lady, he said, just what me hopey. With his knife he cut the tough withies that held the bamboos in their places, and pulled out three of the bars. Come along, he said, no time to lose. Jack scrambled out, but in trying to stand upright gave a sharp exclamation of pain. Percy crawled out more slowly. He tried to stand up, but could not. The Chinaman caught him up and threw him on his shoulder. "'Come along, quickie,' he said to Jack. "'It take ye village. Kill every one.' He set off at a run. Jack followed as fast as he could, groaning at every step from the pain the movement caused to his bruised body. They went to the side of the village opposite to that at which the attack was going on. They met no one on the way, the inhabitants having all rushed to the other side to repel the attack. They stopped at a small gate in the wall. The Chinaman drew back the bolts and opened it, and they passed out into the country. For an hour they kept on. By the end of that time Jack could scarcely drag his limbs along. The Chinaman halted at length in a clump of trees, surrounded by a thick undergrowth. "'Are they safe here?' he said. "'No searchy so far. Here food!' and he produced from a wallet 
a cold chicken and some boiled rice, and unslung from his shoulder a gourd filled with cold tea. He go back now, see what happen. Tomorrow night he come again, bring him more food, and without another word went off at a rapid pace. Jack moistened his lips with the tea and then turned to his companion. Percy had not spoken a word since he had been released from the cage and had been insensible during the greater part of his journey. Jack poured some cold tea between his lips. "'Cheer up, Percy, old boy. We're free now, and with luck and that good fellow's help, we'll work our way down to Canton yet.' "'I shall never get down there. You may,' Percy said feebly. "'Oh, nonsense. You'll pick up strength like a steam engine now. Here, let me prop you against this tree. That's better.' Now drink a drop of this tea. It's like nectar after that filthy water we've been drinking. Now you'll feel better. Now you must try and eat a little of this chicken and rice. Oh, nonsense, you've got to do it. I'm not going to let you give way when our trouble is just over. Think of your people at home, Percy, and make an effort for their sakes. Good heavens, now I think of it, it must be Christmas morning. We were caught on the second, and we've been just twenty-two days on show. I'm sure that it must be past twelve o'clock and it is Christmas Day. It's a good omen, Percy. This food isn't like roast beef and plum pudding, but it's not to be despised, I can tell you. Come, fire away, that's a good fellow. Percy made an effort and ate a few mouthfuls of rice and chicken. Then he took another draught of tea and lay down and was almost immediately asleep. Jack ate his food slowly and contentedly till he finished half the supply. Then he too lay down, and after a short but hearty thanksgiving for his escape from a slow and lingering death, he too fell off to sleep. The sun was rising when he woke, being aroused by a slight movement on the part of Percy. He opened his eyes and sat up. "'Well, Percy, how do you feel this morning?' he asked cheerfully. "'I feel too weak to move,' Percy replied languidly. "'Oh, you'll be all right when you've sat up and eaten breakfast,' Jack said. Here you are. Here's a wing for you, and this rice is as white as snow, and the tea is first-rate. I thought last night, after I lay down, that I heard a murmur of water. So after we've had breakfast, I look about and see if I can find it. We could feel like new men after a wash. You look awful, and I'm sure I'm just as bad. The thought of a wash inspirited Percy far more than that of eating, and he sat up and made a great effort to do justice to his breakfast. He succeeded much better than he had done before, and Jack, although he pretended to grumble, was satisfied with his companion's progress, and finished off the rest of the food. Then he set out to search for water. He had not very far to go. A tiny stream, two feet wide and several inches deep, ran through the wood from the higher ground. After throwing himself down and taking a drink, he hurried back to Percy. "'It's all right, Percy. I've found it. We can wash to our heart's content. Think of that, lad!' Percy could hardly stand, but he made an effort, and Jack half carried him to the streamlet. There the lads spent two hours. First they bathed their heads and hands, and then, stripping, lay down in the stream and allowed it to flow over them. Then they rubbed themselves with handfuls of leaves dipped in the water, and when they at last put on their rags again felt like new men. Percy was able to walk back to the spot they had quitted with the assistance only of Jack's arm. The latter, feeling that his breakfast had by no means appeased his hunger, now started for a search through the wood, and presently returned to Percy laden with nuts and berries. The nuts are sure to be all right. I expect the berries are, too. I have certainly seen some like them in native markets, and I think it will be quite safe to risk it. The rest of the day was spent in picking nuts and eating them. Then they sat down and waited for the arrival of their friend. He came two hours after nightfall with a wallet stored with provisions, and told them that he had regained the village unobserved. The attack had been repulsed, but with severe loss to the defenders as well as the assailants. Two of their guards had been among the killed. The others had made a great clamor over the escape of the prisoners, and made a close search throughout the village, and immediately round it, for they were convinced that their captives had not had the strength to go any distance. He thought, however, that although they had professed the greatest indignation, and had offered many threats as to the vengeance that government would take upon the village, one of whose inhabitants at least must have aided in the evasion of the prisoners, they would not trouble themselves any further in the matter. 
They had already reaped a rich harvest from the exhibition, and would divide among themselves the share of their late comrades. Nor was it at all improbable that if they were to report the matter to the authorities, they would themselves get into serious trouble for not having handed over the prisoners immediately after their capture. For a fortnight the pilot nursed and fed the two midshipmen. He had already provided them with native clothes, so that if by chance any villagers should catch sight of them, they would not recognize them as the escaped white men. At the end of that time both the lads had almost recovered from the effects of their sufferings. Jack, indeed, had picked up from the first, but Percy for some days continued so weak and ill that Jack had feared that he was going to have an attack of fever of some kind. His companion's cheery and hopeful chat did as much good for Percy as the nourishing food with which their friends supplied them, and at the end of the fortnight he declared that he felt sufficiently strong to attempt to make his way down to the coast. The pilot acted as their guide. When they inquired about his wife, he told them carelessly that she would remain with her kinfolk, and would travel on to Canton and join them there when she found an opportunity. The journey was accomplished at night, by very short stages at first, but by increasing distances as Percy gained strength. During the daytime the lads lay hid in woods or jungles, while their companion went into the village and purchased food. They struck the river many miles above Canton, and the pilot, going down first to a village on its banks, bargained for a boat to take him and two women down to the city. The lads went on board at night and took their places in a little cabin formed of bamboos and covered with mats in the stern of the boat, and remained thus sheltered not only from the view of people in boats passing up or down the stream, but from the eyes of their own boatmen. After two days' journey down the river without incident, they arrived off Canton, where the British fleet was still lying, while negotiations for peace were being carried on with the authorities at Pekin. Peeping out between the mats, the lads caught sight of the English warships, and knowing that there was now no danger, they dashed out of the cabin, to the surprise of the native boatmen, and shouted and waved their arms to the distant ships. In ten minutes they were alongside the Perseus, when they were hailed as if restored from the dead. The pilot was very handsomely rewarded by the English authorities for his kindness to the prisoners, and was highly satisfied with the result of his proceedings, which more than doubled the little capital with which he had retired from business. Jack Fothergill and Percy Adcock declare that they have never since eaten chicken without thinking of their Christmas fare on the morning of their escape from the hands of the Chinese pirates. End of A Brush with the Chinese by G. A. Henty.